Okay. Just checking the time here. We're about one minute away. And okay. So if everyone can see my screen, I'm hoping that um, everyone is able to see. And it is 7 o'clock, so we are going to begin. Um, I am Sheila Morrow. I am Mary Ellen's daughter, and I also do the marketing and professional development for Mindwing Concepts. And We'd like to welcome you to the webinar, um, Story Grammar Marker, Two Key Things That Set It Apart, and we're thrilled that you have joined us this evening. And the first thing that I'd like to do is just go over Mary Ellen's biography. Um, she is the founder and president of Mindwing Concepts and has a 40-year professional career, including being a school-based SLP, a college professor, a diagnostician at the Curtis Blake Child Development Center, and she was the prior coordinator for intervention curriculum and professional development at the Curtis Blake Day School for children with language learning disabilities. She designed the Story Grammar Marker in 1991, which is 25 years ago, and since then, she's written 16 publications and developed more than 40 hands-on uh, tools based in the discourse level of language. In 2011, she received the Boise Peace Quilt for her Boise Peace Quilt Project Award for her work with children in the area of conflict resolution and social communication. And in 2014, she received the Alice H. Garside Lifetime Achievement Award from the International Dyslexia Association, the Massachusetts branch, for exemplary leadership, service, or achievement in the area of helping children with dyslexia and language learning disabilities. And Mary Ellen is an internationally recognized presenter. Um, I just want to say a couple things about this webinar because I had had a few questions this week. This webinar is not a how-to, because we only have 30 minutes. It's not a why should you buy something, because we're not trying to sell anything to you right now. Um, and it's not a research or literature review or a lecture. Um, however, if you look in uh, your handouts off to the side, you will see that there are two handouts. One of them is an extensive annotated bibliography or an annotated reference list. And please download it. It's about eight pages long, and Mary Ellen spent a lot of time annotating the bibliography um, for you, so I hope you enjoy that. Um, but what this webinar is today is why. Why does Story Grammar Marker stand out? Why has it sustained itself for 25 years as this amazing narrative development tool that has such power um, with our students and with our clinicians and teachers and specialists. So I'd like to hand this over to Mary Ellen and I hope you enjoy. We are really going to move at a quick pace because we are down to I think 27 minutes now. So um, I'm just going to switch with her and we'll continue. Hello, and thank you, everybody, for coming this evening. Um, I wanted to start with uh, the fact that we are 25 years old this year. It was 25 years ago, and I look quite a bit younger there in the left-hand picture, um, that we began the Story Grammar Marker as a result of my work with children with language learning disabilities. Um, the Story Grammar Marker is a hands-on multi-sensory tool for narrative development. It has meaningful icons that represent the story, the structure of a story. The tool itself is a complete episode, which to literacy experts is the basic unit of a plot. So I want to show tonight that embedded within this tool is a methodology rooted in discourse level of oral language development. 
this is the primary, and um, I'm just I'm just going to spend a few minutes early on. And those of you who are veterans, if you would just um, bear with me while I just give the basics of the story grammar development, a little bit of our story. This was the original impetus for the story grammar marker. It's a graphic organizer that a child was using in a group of beginning writers. And as I um, went in to do the collaborative lesson with the teacher, the little boy had tears in his eyes and said, I never know what to do with my boxes. So obviously the beginning, middle, and end was not enough for him to organize his thoughts. That got me thinking about the second graphic organizer that we used in the school for older students. And while it had more words on it, it didn't have everything that I was reading about in the literature about how narratives were a view of life. So although this was a little bit more um, developed, it wasn't its best. So making the story grammar marker at my kitchen table one night in response to this uh, beginning, middle, end map, these were the icons that I chose to represent the structure of a story. Now, in the late 80s and early 90s, um, I'm thinking about these icons. These icons got me thinking about creating icons for parts of a story. Because when you see icons like this, they draw to your mind memories of what you did at McDonald's, what you had, the experiences, who you went with, how you felt there. Apple, Nike probably brought some ideas about sports. The NBC Peacock certainly brought a lot of stories to mind. And of course, Shell Oil. Maybe there were instances at the gas station when you ran out of gas or your parents did. Now, I just thought that since it was the 25th anniversary, I would just explain to you very quickly why the different icons were chosen. The character has eyes, a face, and a head. And it can be many characters figurative characters, TV characters, novels, historical characters, and of course one of our favorite, Mickey Mouse. Um, the setting is a star with five points. Um, and each point could be used for what you see there, taste there, smell there, touch there. And sailors, when they're looking to navigate for the where and when, they look to the stars, but a setting is much more than a time and a place. A setting is really the situation or the setup of the story. So here we have navigators looking at the stars, and that was my thought. The stars are over everybody's house no matter where the houses are. The initiating event or the kickoff began with a big green button that night I sat at my table. The green button meant go, but as we started to use the marker uh, to talk about stories in school, one little boy came in one morning, and a Monday, uh, Tuesday morning, and he said, you know, I was watching Monday Night Football with my dad, and you know that initiating event? That's just like a kickoff at a football game. The players are all lined up on the field, and nothing happens until the kickoff. So that's why a cleat was chosen. The internal response is probably the classiest part of the story grammar marker. It shines multiple colors on the marker itself, and it's meant to evoke emotions. As you look at the representation here of the magnet, it has a pink heart representing joyfulness, uh, blue representing uh, sadness and green with envy. Those are just kind of some examples of some of the feelings. But so many of our children have such a limited academic vocabulary on feelings. The mental states or thought bubbles um, are important to think about, especially with the growing treatment of theory of mind and perspective taking. 
in the basic um, problem solution structure and also the structure of argument later on. So integral to this critical thinking triangle are these mental states. And I thought of the mental state thought bubble because of um, the Garfield uh, cartoons uh, in the newspapers, the uh, comics, and where Garfield didn't talk but he was always thinking. So thought processes of characters are vital in literature, history, movies, plays, personal situations, and in real life experiences. In other words, the child's personal narratives. The plan was as a result of looking at an intersection in Northampton, Massachusetts, when um, this sign went up to stop and think before you go across the street. Stop, think, and make a plan was, I thought, a great icon for a plan. The planned attempts, I thought about using an abacus because the beads move. And in this case, on the story grammar marker, they move from the character's motivation to the outcome. The direct consequence is the tie-up. And it was represented by tying up a, a little package together. Tie it up with a bow and wrap it up. Then finally, there's another opportunity to think of emotion. In this respect, it's the realization or the reflection after the consequence. How did things turn out and did the character get what he wanted? How did the character feel at the end of the story? This could be you as a personal character or a character in life or in the world. Maybe he lived happily ever after. What was the lesson learned? This ties in with the theme of the story that classroom teachers are trying to get children to do. What lesson was learned? The Grinch learned a lesson, certainly. Maybe Christmas means a little bit more. And what was the moral of the story? In other words, slow and steady wins the race. So the resolution is another chance to reflect on feelings and to talk to ourselves and to each other about the feelings. Uh, 25 years later, icons are the way of the world. And if I just flash any of these icons, you would have many stories about things that you've been involved with within each of these, especially Facebook. So when I began this 25 years ago, people would say to me, that's cute. Or I already use graphic organizers for that, so I don't need anything like that. I don't have time to add something else. My day is so busy. Or that looks like a gimmick for story recall, when actually it's much, much more than that. It is cute, but it's rooted in research and designed to help make sense of stories by engaging children in a hands-on way. Um, traditional graphic organizers do not include feelings, mental states, and plans of characters, as I alluded to. Um, time. Actually, it doesn't matter about time because this is meant to use within your existing practice and within your existing curriculum. And as far as a gimmick for story re recall, I always knew by reading the research that I read in the 80s and 90s and then the current research now, that it's not just about recalling the parts of a story. It's the sequence of story development from vocabulary, to sentences, to discourse, to being able to generate inferences and make connections with cohesion that all impact comprehension writing, critical thinking, and problem solving for our most needy students. Students who are at risk for language impairment, English learners, the students who live in poverty, and children who have social communication problems. It's a way of looking at life. This was a major quote and the major reference that sparked the story grammar marker, Charlene Simon's uh, book and the chapter by Carol Westby on the oral literate continuum and how adequacy and expertise in oral language bootstraps children for later literacy. 
We dream, remember, anticipate, hope, despair, love, hate, believe, doubt, plan, construct, gossip, and yes, learn in narrative. So tonight we wanted to talk about two things that make the story grammar marker what it is and set it apart. Those two things are the SGM sequence of narrative development stages which appear in language textbooks all over the world and also the critical thinking triangle which is the depth of the story grammar marker. I thought this was great when Sheila created this um, particular slide to show the depth of knowledge and uh, competence that can be developed with the story grammar marker as it unpacks a very complex skill. Dancing above the water are the icons of the story grammar marker developed by Bill Noss. And these icons are what it is when you're using the story grammar marker to retell a story. But they don't tell the whole story themselves. What really tells the story for intervention and instruction and assessment is that if we unpack it to look at the developmental sequence in its five stages that are deeper in the water. And then the deepest depth which requires inference and the calling in of world knowledge is the critical thinking triangle. And the ability to infer ours and others' mental states and feelings in order to make a plan to solve a problem or solve a conflict. The story grammar marker put concisely by Sheila Zagula, says that it combines the ease of implementation with the tool for modeling and explicit instruction and providing feedback with the depth of instruction and allows us to begin at the surface and in an organized way deepen confidence and competence. And I think that says it all. It's surface to deep structure of thinking using uh, narrative icons. But let's back up to some of the foundations of the story grammar marker. It's come to my realization because I belong to several reading associations as well as the American Speech, Language, and Hearing Association that over the past 18 months there's been an explosion of articles in the reading journals the Reading Teacher, the International Dyslexia Association Perspectives Journal, about listening comprehension, story retelling, and syntax development, the development of sentences, which has sparked a renewed interest in oral language and its impact on literacy. The aspect of oral language that we're looking at is beyond the level of vocabulary. So it's into discourse development. And the building blocks of oral language, I think, can't be depicted better than on this diagram that I developed in 1991 to show the foundation of literacy. That the foundation of literacy is in the oral language that a child brings to school. And so many of our children do not get to practice at home. So all of these um, from experiences that the child brings to us, to the social uses of language and pragmatics, the phonology or the sound and spelling system, the ever important semantic system or vocabulary system, the development of sentences, simple, compound, and complex for expressing discourse. In other words, for telling stories, for conversing in the classroom and at home, and for solving world's problems in expository text. Without discourse, there is not an efficient connection between oral language development and literacy. In other words, there are many children who can answer questions, but they cannot put it together at the discourse level of language to tell the story to somebody else. These are the text structures along the oral literate continuum from conversation to exposition. 
and the narrative is the bridge, which is why I'm talking about it today. The better you are at storytelling, the better you'll be able to keep up with conversations and retellings in school. The better you are at storytelling, which is the complete episode is the same structure for problem solution, the better you're going to be able to do in history. Um, I didn't want to let this go by without mentioning the Common Core or state standards. These are the speaking and listening standards, K-5, to that are present in the Common Core. And I put them here to just show how fast they ramp up from descriptions and details in grades K and 1 into telling a story and reporting on topics in grades 2, 3, and above. What the Common Core or state standards give us is a roadmap. They don't tell us how to do it. So the story grammar marker sequence of narrative development stages sets the story grammar marker apart. And these are our representations of the developmental sequence. You'll notice at the bottom of each of the re long um, rectangular columns are cohesive tie words that are important to each of those stages. The sequence or the chart shows how human beings grow in their ability to comprehend and express what they comprehended so that others can understand them and they can better understand situations. It was created in 1991 and is rooted in a large body of work talked about here and also at the, um, in our list of references. But what I really wanted to notice, have you note, is although the story grammar marker is a linear tool when we hold it up in front of children, embedded in that tool are the developmental stages. For instance, descriptive sequence is where it all begins with the character and the setting. And I have a little story to tell about a little girl who told me that me and mommy, she said, went to the mall. That is a descriptive sequence. We could describe the mall and everything about it. We could add detail, but that's basically a descriptive sequence. The next stage is an action sequence where the beads are colored in to show the temporal sequence of what is happening within the setting or within the situation. The third stage is the appearance of the kickoff or the breach or the problem, the initiating event or as Michelle Winner calls it, the unexpected. It is the causal chain where the reactions now, they aren't just simple actions, but the beads become reactions to the cause. The fourth stage is a summary of sorts. It's called the abbreviated episode and it includes the feeling. It's the entrance to what Jerome Bruner called the landscape of consciousness. It's getting children to think about feelings in relation to what has happened and how things turned out. And in this summary stage it seems that the um, actions are reduced into a consequence. So it would be me and mommy went to the mall and the cause, what did we do at the mall? We went to J.C. Penney, I bought a new dress, and we went out to eat. The kickoff was that Mommy lost her purse. How did Mommy feel about it? She was worried and afraid. And finally, we found it. That would be the abbreviated episode. The complete episode, if you'll notice, they're not only actions or reactions, these beads become planned attempts and are in reaction to a complete um, critical thinking triangle there. The mental states are here, the plan. So now, when mommy lost her purse and was worried, she thought about, she knew where she had gone. So they decided to retrace their steps and find the purse. They went back to J.C. Penney, and it wasn't there, but they went to Friendly Ice Cream, where she had her supper, and they found it. As a result, Mommy got what she planned and felt wonderful. That was her reflection. As we go into stage six, the complexity of text enters, and this is evident in 
uh, chapter books, novels, and world situations. There are multiple embedded kickoffs. So say in this one, the little girl and her mother got to the store to go find the purse and the store was closing. That would certainly give rise to another feeling. Finally, the last stage is the interactive episode where a kickoff on the part of one character gives rise to feelings, mental states, and plans on the part of another character. In other words, there's another perspective taken. So it's right here that children get trained and uh, explicitly taught, and they have practice in taking perspective. How about daddy? Daddy was concerned about the credit cards in mommy's pocketbook or purse. So he, knowing that that was danger, a danger, decided to call the credit card company to see if it was, if they were safe. So the goal is to get to stage seven and having children there, certainly by the time they enter for the new landscapes of academics, they have to be there between um, grades four to six. The goal is this and how do we get there? We use the developmental sequence if we need to for instruction and intervention. I will mention that there are some children who are able to get it after just modeling and a little bit of explicit practice. There are children who can answer the questions and we know they've comprehended. So what we have to do is draw it out of them and the icons form internal questions for them to ask themselves and ultimately children don't have to carry around a story grammar marker. It's a way to get deeper from early personal experience narratives which are vital for social success all the way to world events and conflicts and social situations. Now within each stage, and I'm only going to mention one of them here because we will do follow-up webinars, um, but within each stage, and I'm taking into consideration the action sequence here, each stage contains work for you to do with macro structure, which is the big structure, the parts of a story, the story grammar icons. And here we have the marker set up and colored in for the action sequence stage, character setting, and a temporal list of actions. There are built-in learning scales. In other words, we can look at the action sequence and we can say, where was our student along these learning scales? Did they have, for instance, two temporally sequenced actions? Our goal is to get them to use cohesive ties at a stage four. Now, these are applicable for intervention, for planning intervention, for assessment, and for our students to know where they are, to know the goal that they are going toward. Um, so there's also a story microstructure embedded in our methodology. The character, where the characters would um, talk about details and develop elaborative noun phrases, naming character and setting and describing them. Um, using cohesive ties, in other words, major um, conjunctions for the narrative. The cohesive ties in this instance would be first, next, after that, but they follow with but, because, and so. Um, the extension of the verbal phrase into adverbs, linguistic verbs, which are verbs that tell us how tone of voice should be, she shouted, she whispered, and then mental state verbs, which en enable us to express perspective taking. And the verb structure is also presented in our manuals in a learning scale. The critical thinking triangle is, um, is, yes, is the next thing, but I just wanted to say we're going to be about eight to ten minutes over. If you have to disconnect, you will receive an email tomorrow with the whole recording. But we hope you stay with us.
we had a lot to put in tonight. Um, so the critical thinking triangle is the second key that sets the story grammar marker apart. And what is it? It's the essence of every story. It is what's missing from most graphic organizers, and it's what gives us as teachers and clinicians the ability to help children generate inferences for academics and life. Inference generation is academic language. So the initiating event that happens sparks the character or multiple characters to have feelings which sparks them to think about the world knowledge and prior knowledge that they can bring to bear on the situation that will help them to make a plan. I wanted to relate that to a traditional graphic organizer, the more advanced one in um, our school and that's widely used now as far as a graphic for storytelling. Um, if you'll notice, there's no place on that for feelings, plans, and mental states. There is a problem noted, but in my experience, by the time many of our children finished the events, the solution didn't ever relate to the problem. So the critical thinking triangle is what's missing, and it, it is what sets the story grammar marker apart. We use it for character motivation. That's the, the feeling that the character has, the emotion. The emotion and the thought contribute to the character making a decision to do something about whatever happened or not. Inference generation. Often authors leave out the feelings. They don't get into the thoughts of characters. They allow the reader to do that, or the listener, or the viewer. It allows us to get into perspective taking. Multiple perspectives may be taken with the story grammar marker within one um, novel, for instance. My granddaughter had to read Lord of the Flies for her summer reading, and so many critical thinking triangles from different characters' perspectives could be formed. Practice with classroom discourse using cohesive ties. This critical thinking triangle can be used in turn and talk to enable children to begin to form the sentences they need to express and connect these components using the conjunctions that you'll note alongside the arrows. Theory of mind. Really, the critical thinking triangle came into being when theory of mind was so researched in relation to social communication and perspective taking. Get into the mind of another character is necessary from little children to world leaders. Critical thinking in general, thinking critically about it. Problem solving. The problem is the kickoff and how to solve it or if we will solve it. Conflict resolution, perhaps you and I got into a conflict on the schoolyard. We each had a different feeling and thoughts. This is a way for us to express that. And then just the whole area of social communication in general. We're going to take these four parts and illustrate them from a personal narrative perspective and beyond. So Sheila, my daughter, and I were at the Portland, Washington International Airport on the way to the hotel. Portland, Oregon, excuse me. Um, and we received a phone call in the taxi from the Delta rep saying that we had the wrong luggage. How did we feel? We were panicked and embarrassed. Now our mental states were many, but we remembered seeing the bags in a row, so we probably didn't check the tags. We knew that our luggage was filled with Brady and other books and would be useless to somebody else. And we believed that the Delta rep would help us find our luggage. So our plan, because of the emotion and the thought, we wanted to get back to the airport as soon as possible to hopefully exchange with another person. Now picture the personal thought 
of the passenger on the Delta flight from Minneapolis to Portland. She noticed that her luggage had not arrived, but a similar bag was the only one left on the carousel. She was worried and frantic. What did she know? She knew she had to find her luggage. She believed that if Delta had the contact person, she could get her luggage back. And also, it was very evident to her that she was headed for China the next day and needed her luggage for a presentation. She needed her clothes and materials. What did she want? She decided, wanted, intended to find a Delta rep to help her contact us. The Delta rep, personal narrative perspective three, a frantic passenger approached who had gotten the wrong luggage off the carousel and was going to China in the morning. He was concerned and determined. He deduced that if the bags looked alike, another passenger might have taken it by mistake. He saw the gold medallion tag and figured we were frequent flyers and realized he could find us. So his intent was to reach us and we um, were called by him, which was our kickoff, and went back to the airport rather sheepishly to exchange the luggage. So that's a personal narrative deep. A surface personal narrative would just be from our perspective, but using the critical thinking triangle, you can get into different people's minds. This is evident from a chapter book. The chapter book, Evidence of the Critical Thinking Triangle, this is in the Year of the Boar and Jackie Robinson. Um, in the Year of the Dog, there lived across the world from New York a girl called Sixth Cousin, otherwise known as Bandit. One winter morning, a letter arrived from the house of Wong from her father, who had been traveling the four seas. On the stamp sat an ugly, bald bird, and the paper was blue. When mother read it, she smiled, but the words made grandmother cry and grandfather angry. No one gave sixth cousin even the smallest hint of why. Now notice, we're going to now infer the whys. The letter which arrived, which was the same kickoff for each of them, in, um, involved the father requesting that the mother and bandit come and live with him in the United States. In response to that, grandmother felt sad. Mother smiled, so we know she felt happy. Bandit was confused because no one informed her. And grandfather felt angry. So I wanted to bring you to another aspect of the critical thinking triangle the vital components of putting the conjunctions with, which are microstructure components with the macrostructure icons to be able to form advanced sentences. It's much more than simple, compound, and complex. We want to connect the elements of what we're thinking about with adequate cohesion across the text. So these are sentence forms. A letter arrived from my father. Now this is the kickoff. So I felt confused and curious and planned to find out what it said. I felt happy and excited because a letter arrived from my husband. So I decided to pack up and organize things to go on a trip to the United States. I planned to convince my son he's making a mistake by staying in the United States because I received a letter from my son and I felt angry. I planned to persuade my son to come back to live in China because I was sad when the letter arrived from my son saying that he wanted to live in the United States with his family. These are ways to express perspective taking and ultimately theory of mind. The reasons why people do what they do. And a lot of our children can't get to that aspect. I wanted to just talk about um, 
Knuffle Bunny by Mo Willems. And I'd like to just show you a very simple video. There's very little wording in it, but it shows emotion and thought. And I, then I'd like to talk about the critical thinking triangle and we'll soon be finished. Sheila's queuing this up for me. Now, Trixie carries Knuffle Bunny everywhere. Notice that Knuffle Bunny is in the washer at the laundromat after a hectic morning of getting them. So this is the initiating event for Trixie, although she can't talk yet. She and her daddy are on their way home. She realizes something, which is a mental state. That's right. We're going home. She's using body language, tone of voice, facial expression, daddy's thinking. Question? Why don't we go back, Daddy? Now, please don't get fussy. Well, Trixie had no recourse. These are her responses to the kickoff. And Daddy's not understanding of her which was unexpected for him. Notice Daddy's feelings. Now, no Look at this man. He's reminiscing. <laughs> Here's Daddy going back home to enlist Mommy's help. Where's Knuckle Bunny? That is an embedded episode. And on their way. Now, Please know that you can purchase this wonderful series. It's actually a series of three books about Knuffle Bunny. And each one gets deeper and deeper into Trixie, Daddy's, and Mommy's perspectives. So what I'd like to show you about the critical thinking triangle related to this video, because certainly children can look at video as well as listen to books. Uh, we did it for time because we wouldn't have had time to read tonight. But Trixie, now here's a fill-in again, was leaving the laundromat when suddenly, which is a word, an academic word for the kickoff, she realized she didn't have Knuffle Bunny. Trixie felt frantic, distressed, and unhappy and decided to get her father to realize that she had lost Knuffle Bunny. How about the bunny himself? He was having what we call a ho-hum day. In other words, he was experiencing what he usually did experience, being carried from place to place by Trixie, while she and her dad ran errands on Saturday, probably. Suddenly, he was thrown into the washer and the laundromat at the laundromat and sees Trixie leave without him. He felt scared and lonely, we would infer. So we would ask children to pull together their memories, what they remember and know about life to generate an inference here. And he decided to hope that they would realize he was lost and come back and get him. What about daddy? Here's a whole critical thinking triangle connector. Trixie was desperately trying to communicate something to him and her behavior became more and more wild. 
Trixie's daddy felt extremely frustrated, embarrassed, puzzled, angry, worried, exasperated, and resigned. And when you're reading the book to the children, you can frame each of these feelings on daddy's face. It is simply wonderful to look at each one of them as he experiences the deepening kickoff. Daddy knows that Trixie wouldn't do this unless something was wrong, and he realizes she can't talk but was using her tone of voice and body language to communicate something important. He wanted Trixie to be happy, which was his plan, so he, he intended to team up with Mommy to solve the problem. Mommy had the key. Trixie's mommy felt distraught and concerned because she noticed that Trixie and her dad did not have Nuffle Bunny and both looked upset while they were standing on the steps of the brownstone. Now notice facial expressions and frightened looks. So Trixie's mommy decided to find Nuffle Bunny. Trixie's mommy remembered, now these are her mental states, she remembered they had Nuffle Bunny when they left. Trixie's mommy knew for a fact that Trixie would be frantic without the bunny. And what about bedtime from her perspective? Trixie's mommy realized that they must have left Nuffle Bunny at the laundromat, and then the entire family went down the street to find it. Um, in looking at 25 years, um, these are the things that we have developed over 25 years to think about the depth of narrative development and how it is much more than a retell, how it bootstraps children for later literacy and social communication, and how if we start with children who are having great difficulty or at risk, we can expect wonderful things. We can explicitly teach them. We can model the structure. We can provide feedback, we can provide practice, and we can also assist them in developing a plan for their writing. So in this webinar, the developmental sequence and the critical thinking triangle were the two keys that I wanted you to have some in-depth knowledge. We will be planning other things, so let us know what you think. Thank you. Sheila's switching with me for one last word. Thank you so much for bearing with us. Um, we know that it was a little bit longer than expected, but I think you will agree that the information that Mary Ellen uh, provided was, was necessary and um, beneficial. And so if people didn't get to stick with it because of other commitments, we will be emailing you the archived version of the recording tomorrow. So if you missed anything or you want to go back to things, that's available. Please don't forget to, um, to download the handouts that are on the side here. Um, we do want you to have access to those. Um, for those of you that are still um, on here, I was just wondering if I could ask you a couple of questions, um, and if you could just click on that for me. Um, okay, so that was how many people use Story Grammar Marker, and the results, um, I'll show you the results. Um, I don't know if you can see them on there. 77 percent said they have used Story Grammar Marker, and 23 percent of you said um, that you had not used it yet. Um, and that's great information for us um, to have. Uh, sorry, wait a minute here. I just clicked off by accident here. Um, and I just want to show this screen up here and let you know that uh, we are on all these areas of social media and I have one other poll I wanted to do if you don't mind this is regarding how long if you have used story grammar marker how long have you used story grammar marker so wow this is really interesting thank you for doing this and sticking with us because it's great information for us to have um, so we have, let's see, 
if people are still answering. So I'm, um, let's see, it looks like about, um, we don't have anyone who's been with, uh, let's see, oh no, we, oh actually we do, we have about 5% of you that were with us for over 20 years, which is really exciting. Thank you for sticking around. 4% 11 to 19 years, which is amazing. 42% um, 3 to 10 years, which means probably we've had some contact with, with a lot of you with this kind of thing, either via webinar or ASHA or workshops or professional development in your own school system. So that's fantastic that we have almost half of you that have been with us that long. And then we have 18% one to two years, so you're really getting into it. And this is a great webinar, I think, for you to really um, continue to delve into this methodology. And then about 32% of you who are pretty new um, to using Story Grammar Marker, 32% um, have been using it for less than a year. So thank you for joining this webinar because I think that um, when you're getting started out, it's great to be able to have this kind of sort of one-on-one, one -on -one, so to speak, or one on um, a number of you um, focus with Mary Ellen if you haven't had a chance to have a workshop with her in real life. Um, but this is fantastic, and we hope that a lot of you will be interested in coming to additional workshops because or additional webinars. So I think this is a great venue for Mary Ellen to get some very specific questions that people have at workshops answered when we can't do it in a live workshop sometimes. Um, so just one other, um, just want to put this up, how to reach Mary Ellen. Um, you can either call her or email her. She's always willing to talk. She loves to talk about um, how you're doing with um, using the methodology or if you are working on doing professional projects or studies, she would love to help you to work on those as well. Um, so this is her passion and I think we can agree that this is an amazing 25 years with more to come. So thank you so much for sticking with us and we will see you at the next um, webinar and tomorrow you will receive the archived version so that you have that recording uh, to review and we'll keep you posted on future webinars. Thank you.